the D-backs face another early season challenge as they have to take on the loaded Atlanta Braves with injuries to both their pitching staff and lineup. And to break down and preview the series, we got Jake Mastriani for a little Lock on Diamondbacks, Lock on Braves crossover. You are Locked on Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We have finally made it. The Braves are home. We're going to play baseball again after two off days, some rainy conditions in Chicago, ready to get home and get our first home series underway against the Arizona Diamondbacks. Looking forward to that. And to help me preview that series, we got Millard joining the show once again. Millard from uh, Locked On Diamondbacks, obviously. Make sure you go give him a follow, subscribe, all that good stuff as well. So he does a fantastic job with a Locked On Diamondbacks. Millard, looking forward to this series. Glad to have you on. We got the we got the regular season champs from last year in the Atlanta Braves going against the National League champs from last year in the Arizona Diamondbacks. Should be a really fun matchup. Yeah, I mean, the Braves are still one of the cream of the crops in the National League, right? Loaded roster, loaded rotation, loaded bullpen. So this should be a big series for both of the teams and a, another good test for the D-backs to prove that, you know what? Last year wasn't a fluke and you could do that with a big statement against the Braves. Yeah, that's really what I want, where I want to start with you is I want to ask, you know, what has this offseason been like? You know, the Diamondbacks, 84-win team, right? And they, they get into the postseason, they get on a run and go to the World Series, ultimately fall to the Rangers there. But a great run, a good young team. But it feels like all the talk in the offseason has been Dodgers, Braves, Phillies, you know, two of those teams that the Diamondbacks took down in the postseason last year. And I feel like there's really not much mention, at least what I hear on the East Coast, about the Diamondbacks. So kind of what is that? mentality for this Diamondbacks team. And and I said this on the podcast last year. I'm not going to go through the 200 podcasts I recorded last year to find right. it. But I remember saying after a series with the Diamondbacks, that is not a team you want to face in the postseason. They're a scrappy team. It feels like they play with a chip on their so- shoulder. They like kind of this underdog mentality. That's kind of the vibe I get from the outside. But I want to know your thoughts. Who is this Diamondbacks team? Yeah, I think this is a D-backs team that has a lot to prove entering this season. Obviously, coming off the National League run, you have great momentum entering this year, positive vibes, but entering the offseason, you didn't want to see your front office just sit on their hands, just be happy with the results that we saw last year because they were ahead of schedule. So was there a little concern that maybe the D-backs sit on their hands and just try to play the internal development route and say, you know what, we were a year ahead of schedule anyway. We don't have to go all in on this team. Instead, the the owner, Ken Kendrick, talked about the extra playoff revenue, how he was going to put it back in this D-back squad, and that's what he did this offseason. The D-backs last year in that postseason, they didn't have a number four starter. Their rookie was a number three. They're going bullpen day number four. Evan Longoria, the statue, had a man third base. There were some obvious weaknesses on this D-backs team, and they addressed it all this offseason. They traded for Eugenio Suarez. They signed two starters to the rotation in Erod who was really good last year for the Tigers, and Jordan Montgomery, who helped the Texas Rangers beat the D-backs in the World Series. You signed two guys to play DH in Jock Peterson and Randall Gritchick, who might make his debut in this series against the Atlanta Braves. So if you're this D-backs team, you wanted your ownership and front office to put money into a team that's coming off this great run. Yes, they're still young, but windows and sports are so small and when you got a glimpse into what the ceiling of this team can be love the fact that this front office and ownership address all the weaknesses this squad has a lot to prove entering the season wants to show that last year wasn't a fluke and they want to also redeem themselves for losing that world series so i think the d-backs are entering this season with the mentality of being the hunters and not just the hunted or did I get that wrong? I don't know. I don't even know. <laughs> They're the hunted yeah, I mean, and the hunters at the same time. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, the way they came off the season, I mean, I, I think, I think they're in that spot where they're probably still the hunter because mm-hmm. even all the moves that you made, what was all the talk in the, the West, the Dodgers and the, all the money that, that they spent. I mean, you just listed off all those great moves the Diamondbacks made. And I, I think probably most people don't know that and don't know mm-hmm. that about the Diamondbacks and all those moves. And that's great to hear from a fan perspective, to, to see a team that 
had a good run, got to the World Series, and it wasn't just like, okay, that was a great year. Let's just hope that it happens again. So I- I'm happy to hear that. A couple of moves that you made, well, one in particular, obviously all Braves fans love Jock Peterson and will, will yeah. forever love Jock Peterson. So that's somebody that every offseason he's available. I have Braves fans ask me, can we get Jock back? Can we get Jock back? Diamondbacks take him. But the one that I really wanted for the Braves, when you know they had a spot in left field, I really wanted them to get Lourdes Gurriel. Uh, he just seems like that kind of glue type of player can can do it all for you is going to come up in big spots and he's off to maybe the best start yeah. of any Diamondbacks hitter, hitter right now I think he hit a home run in three straight games so yeah. talk a little about about Lourdes and kind of the signing him and the impact that he's going to have on this Diamondbacks team yeah I mean player of the week like you just mentioned start off the season really hot and what's crazy is he was like the secondary piece in the trade for uh, Dalton Varsha, right? A year ago, D back straight up and coming outfielder Dalton Varsha to the Blue Jays. Gabriel Moreno, their starting catcher, was the prize in that deal with Lords Goriel just being the secondary piece, pending free agent, didn't know if you were going to re sign him. And last year, he has himself a really good year with the D backs, probably the MVP of the team last year to start the year, the first couple months. Uh, brings the great vibes, the purple hair to the locker room, and he's a super clutch player as well. So to get him as a second secondary piece in that Gabriel Moreno deal. Like, I don't even know if you would do Dalton Varsho for Lords Guriel straight up right now. So great move by Mike Hayes in there. And Guriel, I mean, he would have been a great addition to the Atlanta Braves. Still, somehow you guys got like Adam Duvall to help you out in the outfield. I mean, you guys, the rich keeps getting rich over there. Maybe, you know, should take a look at old friend Jorge Soler a little bit. I mean, he was out there for a little bit. I would have loved to see him not go to the NL West San Francisco Giants. But Lords Guriel has been really good for this D-back team. And to see him re-signed on like a pretty modest three-year deal i mean he's been an impact bat for the d-backs since day one yeah i love that move love that signing like i said he was he was i think he was my number one target for the braves going into the offseason mm. somebody that i really wanted i i thought that highly of him now we know about Cattell Marte. we know about corbin carroll who's maybe off to a little bit of a slow start we know about christian yeah. walker we've obviously talked about lord escuriel who is somebody else in this lineup that maybe okay. the braves fans don't know about that they, they should keep an eye on in this series yeah, this one is a real easy answer. It is Blaze Alexander because he tore it up in spring training. He was the best D-backs player in spring training. So far to enter the season, he's been continued that hot streak from spring. 417 average, 1167 OPS. He's a rookie playing his first games in Major League Baseball. And the D-backs are dealing with a little bit of injury right now. Perdomo got hurt in the last game, so that just opens up even more of a door for Blaze Alexander to play on the left side of the infield. He's been a guy 25 crushed it in the minor leagues last year. Now he gets to do it on the major league level. I would say he's the guy to watch out for after coming off a game where he just hit his first home run as well. He's been crushing it at the plate every single game for like five straight weeks now. So I would say Blaze Alexander is that guy to keep an eye on. Yeah, kind of leading you in that direction. I know he's been yeah. on fire uh, since coming up, and I watched him the other night in that Yankee series. Great, well-played series there by the Diamondbacks. I know they dropped it, but that was a really yeah. fun series to watch. But I, uh, in watching Blaze Alexander, I mean, he looks like somebody in the box that's about to crush the baseball. I love this swing. Looks very athletic. So uh, definitely somebody Braves fans need to watch out for. All right, next, I'm going to turn the mic over to Miller. Let him ask me some questions. We'll get into the pitching matchups, obviously, uh, at the end of this. But next I'll turn it over to Millard, and we'll talk a little bit about the Braves. Everyone wants to eat healthier, but doing so can be a pain to plan and take so much time. It's also super expensive. That's not the case when you use Factor Meals. Eating better is easy with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian approved and ready to go in just two minutes. You'll have over 35 different options to choose from every week, including Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Also, there are more than 60 add-ons to help you stay fueled up and feeling good all day long. My wife loves the two-minute meals. We both work. It's busy at home. You got three kids. It's hard to prep for meals. So to have these quick factor meals that you can just get ready, restaurant quality in two minutes really makes things a lot simple. They have pancakes, smoothies, and more. You can discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day. No prep, no mess for meals. Enjoy that as well. Not a lot of cleanup there, and it's flexible for your schedule. Get as much or as little as you need by choosing your meals every week. Factor is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast premium options with no cooking required. 
When we've done the math, Factor is less expensive than takeout and every meal is dietitian approved. Head to factormeals.com slash locked on MLB 50. Use code locked on MLB 50 to get 50% off. That's code locked on MLB 50 at factormeals.com slash locked on MLB 50 to get 50% off. March Madness is here. You got the final four this weekend, which means the biggest moments in college basketball are happening, both men's and women's college basketball prize picks offers injury insurance so your entry stays alive even if you have a player go out say in the first half of a basketball game they don't return you just remove that player from your entry and the rest of your entry stays alive they also offer weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts and prize picks is really simple to play i can make my picks and submit them in less than 60 seconds it's really just that simple all you do is pick two to six players or group of two to six players and decide more or less on stats like strikeouts home runs hits and so much more millard you're going to load up your prize pick app on friday you're going to see spencer strider at seven and a half strikeouts you going more or less oh we got to take the under i got right on my boys the d-backs to take the under on that one so Miller's taking under. I'm obviously going to take the over or, or pick more on that. Whatever it's going to be, you'll see that over on Prize Picks on Friday. Download the app today. Use code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Again, download the app today. Use code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Prize Picks. All right, Miller, let's jump back into the conversation here, and I'm going to turn things over to you, let you ask me some questions about my Atlanta Braves. Okay, yeah, because I do have, they're kind of like D-backs times Braves questions because I've been working on this little MVP theory because I always feel like the next MVP is kind of a reflection of the last MVP. So I want to look at Ronald Acuna, 40 home run guy, 70 stolen bases. I think who in the NL can also put up numbers similar to that? I think a guy like maybe Fernando Tatis. I think a guy like maybe Mookie Betts. And of course, I think of my guy, Corbin Carroll. So I want to know how much of a threat do you see Corbin Carroll to potentially stealing an MVP award away from Ronald Acuna? I mean, he's certainly possible. He's in that group, like you mentioned. And with the stolen bases and uh, going up these days, Corbin obviously has that potential to steal 50, 60. I mean, I don't think there's any reason he can't get to 70 or 80 as much as he is able to get on base bat batting at the top of that order. So I think he's definitely a threat. I don't know that it's going to be this year, but I mean, coming off the season that he had, I mean, winning, you know, rookie of the year and all that. I mean, he is certainly on his way to be there. I, I don't know enough about the power potential. If he can get to 30, 40 home runs, that seems like a bit of a stretch right now for Corbin Carroll. Uh, but if he can, I mean, he's got the stolen base. I think he has the average as well. He is definitely in that group with the guys that you just mentioned, at least in the National League. You know, you look at the American League, Bobby Witt's one name that comes to mind. It's kind of similar player yeah. like that young player can got the power, got the speed as well. But I think that's where the game's going. I think that's where the sport is wanting the game to go to highlight more of these guys who have that dual threat potential with the new rules to be able to elevate their speed and showcase that. And then players that also have that that power potential to go along with it. I think you're going to see more guys like Ronald, like Corbin, like Fernando Tatis and others get more into these awards because of just the incredible things that they're able to do both on the base pass and at the plate with the power. Yeah, and it just makes the game more fun, right? If you're going to have more guys attempt to steals, you're going to have more guys in runners and scoring positions, just more action on the bases, guys getting thrown out, just more chaos overall. And that's what the D-backs did all of last season, create chaos. And so I want to know, how much do the Braves like to play into that? Because we know they're loaded with star power, but how much do they go through the small ball? You know, maybe we just want to lay down a sacrifice and get this runner over. Maybe we just want to steal some bases, or is it just all, oh, we're, you know, we're a loaded team. Let's just swing away at the plate. Yeah, so it's the final one there. And that's why I said last year, I said the Diamondbacks scare me as a team because they play that that kind of chaos baseball. They can play that small ball. They can move runners over. They can steal a base. And, you know, that's those are things that in the postseason where maybe you're facing top pension all the time, maybe those home runs aren't always there. And that's why the Diamondbacks do scare me in a, a short postseason format like that because the Braves don't do that. Look, they had two sacrifice bunts all of last year. They had one sacrifice bunt the year before. I'm not lobbying for more. When you have a lineup that the Braves do, you don't want to make outs on the base pass. You don't want to give up outs. You want these guys swinging away. They led the majors with 307 home runs last year. So it is not that type of offense. It is an offense 
built around hitting two, three run homers, you're not even really going to see. I mean, there's Ozzy could steal 30, 40 bases if he wanted to. He doesn't. I think Michael Harris could steal 30, 40 bases if he wanted to. He doesn't. Outside of Ronald, who just has a green light and wants to run that much and batting at the top of the lineup, it's kind of what you want him to do. There's really not a lot of guys on this team that are a major speed threat. I mean, I think Kelnick, Harris, Ozzy, they'll probably all get you know close to 20 bases this year, but there's not really that huge speed threat. Even with Ronald and all the bases he stole last year, you know, the Braves of the team weren't necessarily that high overall in stolen base attempts. So it's really more about just getting on base, taking your hits, not running into outs, not giving up easy outs, and just letting your sluggers do work. I mean, Marcelo Zuna's batting fifth, sixth in the order. He hit 40 home runs last year. You got you had Eddie Rosario, who's been replaced by Jared Kelnick. He had 20 home runs down at the bottom of the order last year. So, I mean, it's just home run potential up and down, and that's typically how they're going to get it done when they when they win games. Yeah, I guess when you got all that power, you don't really want to create a, uh, create outs on the base pass, which makes a ton of sense, of course. You've talked a lot saying you're scared of the D-backs a little bit in a playoff format. You know, they're scrappy. You wouldn't want to run into them. But if you actually had to do like a little ranking of teams you don't want to see in the postseason with the Dodgers, the Phillies, the D-backs, the Padres, like where would the D-backs actually rank for you of teams you would most be afraid of, you know, at this point of the season, I guess, April 5th or whenever we're dropping this podcast? Yeah, it's tough to say right now just because the Diamondbacks pitch, I know is a little banged up. Braves yeah. hopefully getting them at a good time. You know, if you had Jordan Montgomery, you had a healthy Erod, I think the conversation might be a little bit different. Um, but I would probably put the Diamondbacks third out of that group. I'd probably put the Phillies first. I just think the Phillies match up with the Braves, and we've seen it the last two postseasons. Mm -hmm. They match up with the Braves better than anyone. They have the power up and down that lineup. They have the big arms coming out of the bullpen. They got Wheeler and Nola at the top. So I'd probably say Phillies, Dodgers, Diamondbacks, ranking those three. I, I don't know of anybody else really in the National League that I am even slightly afraid of in the postseason. I mean – we all know what can happen in the postseason. Look, I yeah. go on record and say it. 2021 is the worst of the last three teams that the Braves have had, and they won the World Series. The last two years, those teams have been way better than the 2021 team, but you get hot in October, and you can go on a run and can see what happens. But I would say the Diamondbacks would still be third on that list. I mean, I can't ignore what the Dodgers have done and that three-headed monster that they have now at the top. Uh, with Freddie and Mookie and Otani and then Glass now, if he's going to stay healthy, is obviously really good. I think Yamamoto is going to be really good. Uh, I do worry about the depth of their rotation, which is probably why I put them behind the Phillies, even though I know the Phillies back half of their rotation is not all that great. But still, they're, they're two guys at the top, Wheeler and Nola, have just proven come postseason time that they're going to get it done. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. I probably would have the Phillies at the top too, just because those guys just freaking step up when it's that playoff atmosphere. The Bryce Harpers, the Kyle Schwarbers, like I don't know if there's a duo more scary than those two when they step up to the plate, especially when they're playing in that home crowd of Philadelphia, which is probably the best playoff home crowd right now uh, once you get to the postseason. So I, I would honestly even have the Phillies in my number one postseason ranking. Even though I think the Braves are the most loaded team, I think the Phillies in a playoff setting are probably the scariest. One final question for you before we get to segment number three. Know you guys trade for Jarrett Kalenic this offseason. He was a former top prospect, kind of struggled the last few years with Seattle. How much faith do you have him actually turning into like a decent to, you know, above average major leaguer and maybe even realizing the potential that we thought he had back in the day? You would have asked this three weeks ago. I think a lot of Braves fans would have said their confidence is not very high. He meant the Braves made a lot of adjustments with him since coming over. They really tried to quiet down his hands and his swing. Uh, and it's really seeming to pay off. I mean, he has been on fire to begin the year himself. And you really start to saw the, see the change about the final week of spring training as he started to make some of those adjustments. So I am extremely confident that the Braves are going to turn him into an above average player. Uh, again, Eddie Rosario was there last year. He was a 1.5 to 2 ward type of player. I think that's probably the floor for Jared Kelnick right now. And I think he's even better defensively. So at the very least, I think the Braves are just as good this year in left field as they were last year. You combine him with Adam Duvall and when they're now kind of in a platoon situation, and I think they're very strong in left field. But again, the results we've seen the last couple of weeks and it's small sample size, Jared Kelnick's swing is starting to look much better. He's starting to make 
much better contact, get some more lift on the baseball. So Braves have done a great job. And look, they I've said this plenty of times, they made a lot of moves, took on a lot of contracts, bad contracts to get Jared Kelnick. I don't think they do that unless they felt pretty confident that there were some changes with him that they could make to kind of turn things around with him. And at the end of the day, he's batting ninth in, in this order. Yeah. I mean, if he is a one and a half, two or player, so be it. But I am pretty confident that they're going to turn him into a really solid player. That's why I would just. Right, such for- a, oh, sorry. sorry yeah. I was just going to make one point. I was just going to say yeah. that's always just a smart move to get a wild card piece like that as a former top prospect to be at the bottom of your lineup. Uh, super smart by the Braves, of course. Yeah. And again, like I said, it's it's no pressure on him. I mean, if it doesn't work out, he's making still making league minimum. He hasn't started arbitration yet. So oh, wow. uh, I think a great, great move by the Braves, kind of low risk. If he's got it, then you have him under team control for a while. If he hits that potential, fantastic. This lineup just becomes even more and more deadly. All right, next, we'll turn our attention to this weekend series. Talk about the pitching matchups with, I think, heavily favor the Atlanta Braves. We'll see if Millard agrees on that. We'll get into everything here next. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with that 3% match. This offer is good, again, through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info as well. Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Gold. Global market research investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. All right, Miller, we are here. It is the Braves home opener this weekend. Always a special weekend for the Atlanta Braves. I will be there on Saturday. It's the first time, Millard, and I think 13 years that I'm going to miss a home opener, not counting 2020, obviously, oh, wow. but family comes first. Kid has a b- baseball game on Friday night. I'm the coach. I got to be there. I thought about okay. just, just getting somebody to sub, but I got to be there, but I'll be there on Saturday. Cannot wait to be my first game of the year. Looking forward to it. Going to get to see Max Freed in that start because he got pushed back with the rain outs in Chicago. But here's the, here's the matchups right now. You can let me know if you think some of this may change for the diamondbacks, but on Friday night, Tommy Henry versus Spencer Strider. I got to think that's advantage Braves. Brandon fought against Max Freed. Fought's good. Had a good postseason run. Max Freed had a rougher start, but I'm still going to go Freed in that one. And then Ryan Nelson versus Chris sale. I got a lane sell in that one as well. It's like I said earlier, it's a it's a good time for the Braves to be playing the Diamondbacks. You got some injuries in the rotation. Obviously, just signed Jordan Montgomery, going to be coming up soon. Eduardo Rodriguez out. Closer Paul Seawald is out right now. I know Alec Thomas, outfielder, is out, and he was off to a, a pretty good start. So if you got to play the Diamondbacks, you can't always pick when you play a team how they're going to be. I know the offense has still looked really, really good early on, but I got to think the Braves are, are catching the Diamondbacks at a pretty good time. Yeah, it's pretty glaring when you look at the matchups of who's going for the Braves and who's going for the D-backs. Tommy Henry and Ryan Nelson did not have a good first start through the first turn through the rotation. They were both battling for the number five star through spring training, but after signing Monty, they are now both battling just to stay on the major league roster as a long reliever, and so far is not looking too good for either of them. Game two is definitely where I'm hoping uh, the D-backs can get that win, and then we'll see what happens in game three because Fott was really good the first start of the year, of course, against the Colorado Rockies. Should be a lot different against the Atlanta Braves. But Freed did struggle in his first start and is someone that has dealt with a lot of injuries last season. So maybe he's still, you know, ramping up. Obviously, that's more of your call than mine. But maybe he's not entirely in the the right place yet, you know, at this point of the season, still early, maybe still working into peak Max Freed shape. So I'm hoping 
D-backs take game two, and then we enter that rubber game match. And hopefully Ryan Nelson, who has been working on his secondary pitches, his tertiary pitches this offseason, not trying to be as reliant on the fastball. Hopefully all the offseason work finally pays off in game number three, because in game one, it looked like more of the same of what we saw last year with the struggles. So hopefully in game number three against the Braves, we can see that switch finally flip for Ryan Nelson. Yeah, certainly hope that doesn't happen. I want to see this Braves offense who, look, they were playing in snow in Chicago and they only, and Garrett Crochet is off to a fantastic start. But outside of that, the offense has been what we thought it would be. Uh, So I think this is definitely an opportunity going against a couple of fifth starters, it sounds like, in Henry and Nelson. They got an opportunity to put some runs on the board there. Chris Sell looked really good in his debut with the Braves. Spencer Strider obviously looked solid in his as well. Five innings, gave up a two-run homer in that fifth inning, but otherwise looked like his dominant self. And I'm looking for him to go even deeper in the game in this one, hopefully. But it is a a really good Diamondbacks offense, so it's going to be a tough one. As for Max Freed, he didn't have the command. He didn't have the control to start that game against the Phillies. I don't know if you saw it, but he threw a 3-2 fastball basically right down the middle to Nick Castellanos, and for some reason it was called a a ball. And it ended up being a a walk and it ended up going leading to three runs in the inning when he should have been out of it because it was a three, two pitch with two outs. So look, he didn't have it, but he should have gotten out of that first inning clean. And then maybe, you know, he's a veteran probably figures it out, but it's a contract year for Max Reed. It's a big season for him. So certainly he's hoping to, to put up some good numbers and hit free agency and get a, a good contract. Although as we just saw with guys like Jordan Montgomery, who just won a world series with the Rangers where he puts really well, he had to settle for a short-term deal. So we'll see how that all that plays out. But yeah, I actually want to ask you about Freed's pending free agency because of course you already have a bunch of dudes on long-term contracts where you talk about the Braves more in the lineup. And then also just the way baseball is, like there's a lot of teams have gone burned by giving out big time free agent contracts to pitchers like we've seen with the Carlos Rodons and the Jacob DeGroms uh, of recent years. So like how much concern do you have in the Braves, you know, maybe letting Max Fried walk? Maybe you think it's a smart move to let Max Fried walk. Like what are your thoughts on this pending free agency? Yeah. So all of, you know, the long-term moves the Braves have done, they've all been for position players. The only one, the only pitcher they've given out a long-term deal is Spencer Strider. And that was basically to buy out his arbitration years and a couple of free agency years, which is looking pretty smart at the moment. I've been saying for over a year now that I think Max Fried is gone. If he's going to get a Carlos Rodon deal of six years, that's just too risky in today's environment for pitchers. And especially a guy like Fried, he has had some injuries concern over the the last several years. So I think he's gone unless he does a short-term deal like, Jordan Montgomery, like Blake Snell, have had to do. Maybe if he were willing to do that, do, you know, not to the level that Zach Wheeler just did, but he just took a three-year deal. Obviously, he's a little bit older. I think he's 35, but I could see that type of deal happening. Alex Anthopoulos is not going to give a six- or seven-year deal to a starting pitcher going into their early to mid-30s. It's just not what he's looking to do because a lot of those contracts end up hurting the team. Uh, so yeah, I, I think he's I think he's most likely gone. I think it's probably his last year with the Braves. We'll see how all that plays out because a lot of people think he'll go to the Dodgers, as most people think the best free agents will. But they've got a lot of pitchers already in their rotation. I don't I, you know I don't know that he necessarily fits in there. Obviously, he's Max Free. They'll find a way. But I think he's gone at the end of the season. But hopefully, he gives us one more great season and leads us to a World Series. Ah, well, I don't know about that, but I, I wish more people did the Zach Wheeler because like, I think that's one of the issues in baseball. It's like every pitcher, every position player wants a seven to 12 year deal. Like I wish more guys just did, you know what? Pay me 40 million a year for just two, three seasons. And then add in a couple opt outs or whatever. Like I think it would make it more interesting when it comes to free agency. I just think the overall product could be better. Like I, I just don't actually like seeing a guy like Yamamoto now sign the rest of his career with the LA Dodgers. Like I want to see some of the best players. They don't have to move but at least test the market and see what you can get from other teams. So I actually wish we saw more short-term contracts in major leagues. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we see that, at least for pitchers. I think for position players, you're still going to see those long-term deals. I mean, you just saw the Dodgers give Will Smith a 10-year deal. But I think for pitchers, at least, with where injuries are today in the pitching environment, I would not be surprised if we see things move that way. You know, I know Max Scherzer and Justin Verlander were at the end of their careers, but they're guys that got, you know, small deals with high AAVs. And I think that could be the way that we're going with these veteran pitchers. But getting back to the series this weekend, Braves, Diamondbacks, we looked at 
some of the hitters going on, on each side. We looked at the pitching matchups. Millard, go ahead. Give me your predictions. Who's taking the series? You know, I'm a very unbiased fan, so I will actually say the Braves take two out of three from the D-backs here. The schedule lines up a little bit for the D-backs after this. They start to get healthy. Monty's supposed to make his debut in a couple weeks. Erod shouldn't be too far away. So like you said, this is the right time to catch the D-backs. They're banged up all over their lineup, their pitching staff. So I will say Braves take two out of three due to the injuries of the D-backs. Yeah, I, I took the the Phillies in the first series of the year, and fans let me have it. I'm not going to pick the opposing team again. And this is a series just based on the pitching matchups. The Braves honestly need to win. I mean, like we said, we're catching the Diamondbacks at a good time. It's got to be a series you come away with. So I think the Braves do take two of three. I think that Diamondbacks offense is good enough that they maybe get going in one of these games and take one. But I think the Braves do ultimately win the series just because of the advantage they have in the starting pitching right now because of some of those injuries to the Diamondbacks. Miller, thanks so much for joining again. If you have it, go over to Locked On Diamondbacks, subscribe over there, follow Miller on social media. You see his, his handle there, so make sure you go and give him a follow. But thanks so much. Great discussion. Looking forward to this series. Looking forward to getting to the ballpark so that I can watch the Braves this weekend. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to Locked On Braves on YouTube. Hit that thumbs up button. Follow us on social media at shortstop ball at locked on underscore braves. Make sure that you rate review and subscribe to the lockdown braves podcast, wherever you get your podcast. And we'll talk to you next time.